Thank you for joining us for State of the Art Southern Illinois, a podcast by the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Today's guest is Pat Hazel of The Good Humor Men. The Good Humor Men will be coming to the Marion Cultural and Civic Center July 22nd. Tickets are available at marionccc.com. Pat is a writer, comedian, producer, and overall creative. He was an original writer on Seinfeld and has since written and produced multiple plays And he is the host of Creativity in Captivity, a podcast. Really hope you enjoy our conversation today with Pat Hazel. Pat, thank you for joining us today. Hey, it's my pleasure. I love the arts. I love what you're doing. So it's kind of going to be fun to catch up. It is. And... Uh, you and I have known each other for quite a while, but we've got you coming to Marion with the Good Humor Men on July 22nd. Tickets just went on sale this past Friday. Uh, so what should we expect with the Good Humor Men coming to Marion? Well, number one, we're all back together, right? This is a, These are live events. There's laughter. There's contagious, you know, people just f- feeling other people laugh is a very powerful sort of healing thing. The Good Humor Men is... It's the Rat Pack for comedy in some ways, except without the booze and the women and the mafia connections, it, 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 which means none of that. But um, uh, it's I've picked <laughs> I've picked a pedigree of comics that are all rising stars in late night that have done the various television shows that you know the Tonight Show and uh, those kinds of shows, and it's really super fun just to be in a place where we can be back on the boards with live audiences after a couple of years. So. I mean, I hope the audience, I know yours has been coming out handily for recent shows. So there's just a difference in how people behave uh, now because they don't take for granted being together as a community. And we're so thankful to have things coming back and, and to have people back in here and sharing those experiences again. It's, it's, so, it's so beneficial for the community and it's such a great, rich way to build ties within the community as people having those shared experiences. Yeah, the, the, the comics that I'm bringing, uh, Tony Deo and Keith Alberstadt, are both pros, right? They've done a lot of television. They've written for other people. They're, they're on YouTube. They're a lot of places. So what I, one of the things we're proud of with the Good Humor Men, and it's not squeaky clean, but it's broadcast television clean, which means that you can watch it with your parents or your kids or whatever. Um, but it's irreverent, and it's, you know... Um, it's, we just don't cross the line into dirty, too dirty of comedy. So if people are concerned about that, it's, it's a good one to, to come to as a family. We're, we're really looking forward to that. Um, let's, let's jump into to how you got your start in comedy. Um, you were a writer on Seinfeld and you toured with him as well. How did, you, how did you meet Jerry Seinfeld and get connected to him like that? Yeah, it's funny. That was midway into my career because I started out as a kid magician. I did magic tricks and juggled on street corners and things like that. And so I had a variety act when I went to Los Angeles and I kind of vowed to set down the props and learn to do stand up without all of that. And I, my stomping grounds were the comedy magic club in Hermosa beach where Jerry Seinfeld and Jay Leno and Gary Shandling, all, all sorts of people were working out their new material. And it was in that, that Jerry saw me and asked me, he liked the energy that I had, so I opened for him for his very first special. It was an HBO special called Stand Up Confidential. Uh, it was not something that it was that I was on camera, but I got the studio audience going and did that kind of a thing. And he then took me out on the road, uh, and at that time, I was still schlepping props and juggling hats, top hats, and doing magic tricks. And he had a big influence in encouraging me to just props behind and come tell the stories and try the jokes, promising that I wouldn't get fired for taking this sort of step to just have a microphone and a glass of water. And and so he gave me quite a bit of breathing room to do that. In the course of that, he saw how I wrote and what I was doing, and it happened to sort of feather into his development of the sitcom. So he and Larry David wrote the pilot and we're ready to go with NBC, and they were doing it through Castle Rock. So we submitted, I had a partner who wrote a play with me. We submitted that play to be our writing sample, and he and I got the first writing jobs. That was a guy named Matt Gold. We got our first 
positions in television on the Seinfeld show with no other sitcom writing experience, nothing. So it was a golden ticket into television. And now Seinfeld was a pretty big hit immediately, right? Not so much. I mean, he was a great stand-up comic, and people knew who he was from his appearances on Letterman and The Tonight Show. But the sitcom didn't land quite at the beginning because it wasn't done under prime time. It was done under specials or something. So we had a budget for four shows. And at that time, before it went on, it was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. That's a little inside, you know, trivia. And uh, so they didn't know when to put it on. It didn't have a time slot. So it was kind of a few different places. And then the Gulf War hit. And that meant it didn't come on because they were getting newsworthy things first. And it wasn't until a bit later when Cheers was going off the air and it got the time slot following Cheers where all the eyes were that people started to kind of come on board and go, oh, wow, this is really funny. And that, I think, was kind of the beginnings of must-see TV's Thursday night lineup. So was there a, a specific moment when, when as the writers... You guys knew, hey, this this really is going to take off and 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 move forward. Not really, <laughs> because they you waited for a pickup. Even the actors, people like Jason Alexander and stuff, he came from the East Coast. He didn't buy a house in California for years because he wasn't sure. You know, like it was one of these things where waiting to see is this going to go? Is it going to go one more season? Um, that took a while for that. But I mean, I think that the loyal audience was there. Um, the people who were kind of who got it were there early. They were putting the word out, but it did take a while to catch on. And surprisingly, I think that helps its longevity, which is that the the episodes are pretty fun and evergreen and people are coming to it on Netflix now for the first time and they're watching it all and they've got, you know, eight or nine years of episodes ahead of them. So it's pretty, it's pretty fun that it didn't, that it didn't get like all wasted in the first year, you know? Yeah. And, and you were there, you were part of the writing staff for the entire run of that sitcom? No, I, I okay. was there for just a few years. I was not on the pilot, which was the first episode. I came on board when they started the sort of the first pickup. And I stayed there as a writer a very short period of time. And then I would say, uh, and I also was the studio audience warm-up comedian, which I subsequently did one day a week for 75 episodes or something. Now, what is, what is that like? It's not great. I mean, it, <laughs> it's it's fun to see the show being taped live, lots of things, but it's not fun to be the guy who stands in front of people while there's all this dead time and cameras are moving and you're trying to educate and entertain people because it makes for a long night. And So it's not just like opening before the recording no. starts. It's every time there's a transition, you're back yeah. up, just on cue, ready to go, trying to be Yeah, fine. and in fact... It's, it's it, it often it would be three to four hours of time with the audience and if it was a particularly difficult thing or stuff had to be shot multiple times you were there even longer but the weird part is you do when you shoot a sitcom you you always are shooting scenes twice back to back to be sure you have everything and the camera coverage is right and all of that kind of stuff but the audience sees it the first time like in a play and they laugh and it's fun. The second time they're like, I just saw that. And their response and their behavior is like, I want more. I want to see the story continue. So it's a fairly frustrating night to be an audience member. <laughs> um, and, or if something changes, you know, if something gets dropped and they go, we need to shoot that again. Everyone's like, Oh, third time I got to watch this, you know? So, <laughs> so it is really interesting to piece it together. And it is the job of that studio audience warm up person to keep the energy and remind people what the story was or to explain why you don't get to see this because we shot it in a car earlier today, but we'll reenact it in two folding chairs and then people have to kind of imagine it. And, you know, so the process is, I would say, interesting, but after you've been to one taping, you realize I would really rather pay for a ticket to a play or go to something where I can have a fulfilling evening. Um, mm -hmm. And also it's kind of, interesting i always used to answer questions about anything about how it works and how much people make and why is that guy what does he do with the boom mic up there and whatever because i was pretty intimate with the show so i could get into the nooks and crannies and you know let the audience know about it but it gets to a point where you say these questions are so dumb 
that you look at them. And I used to say, no question is a bad question. But somebody raised their hand midway through a show and go, is this a repeat? And I go, we're shooting the stupid thing right now. You know, like, like no, we don't shoot the repeat if we've already shot the episode. You know, So I think like any job, you can get to a point where you go, I've been here too long, you know? Uh-huh. And it, like, so as a comedian, is that having that much time, that much just time in front of an audience, is there any advantage of like working through new material and, and testing things out in, in that type of a not, not, layout? I'll tell you why. The I, see the, yeah, I hear the question and I, I would say not really. The reason is that you literally never know when they're going to be ready to shoot. And you can be in the middle of the setup or in the middle of the punchline and a bell, ah, okay, we're going, camera's rolling. Like, and you, then they shoot something for five minutes and you can't come, come, come back and say, like I was saying, it, it just, it's so frustrating. And um, I did do in the beginnings of some of those, I, I guess what it taught me, it taught me a, a slightly different improvisational style of communicating with an audience. And which is just pay attention to what's right in front of you. What's happening now? Right. If somebody, you know, sneezes, respond to it. If this happens, deal with it. Right. Also, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It's just playing the moment out. And I used to come with, I'd bring my mail. And so rather than do jokes and test them, I would go, oh, we got five minutes. I, we're going to go through my bills. And they would go, what? And I go, hey, I'm multitasking, you know, whatever. And I would try, I would try <laughs> to make something out of it instead of, have a plan that was constantly being destroyed. And there was a time when I was uh, rehearsing for the play A Few Good Men, which was a Aaron Sorkin piece that was subsequently a movie and so forth. But um, I was playing a role in that as the JAG lawyer that Tom Cruise played. And uh, I w was memorizing my lines in the daytime. So I just brought the script and... <laughs> handed it to an old guy in the audience and I made him play the Jack Nicholson part. And, you know, he's like, you can't handle the truth. And then I would respond to him. Whatever. And the audience seemed to find that very amusing because of how shoddily the other guy read, read the uh, Jack Nicholson part. But I it was just, I would just do whatever it required on the day of to get through it. You know, it sounds like it, it sounds like an incredibly stressful environment to, to be a performer. And to be completely derailed constantly, and and to learn yeah. to, to live with that frustration in front of people. Right, and also, by the way, you're not in show business. Well, it seems like you are, but there's a rail between the sound stage where they're shooting and the audience that's sitting there, and you are literally in between those two worlds. You're not an audience member, <laughs> and you're really not. You're helping, but you're not really on the production staff. You're not an actor. You're not a producer. And neither of those groups cares. Uh, they, you're not on their team, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it, I, the closest thing I could say is that you're kind of like the Jungle Cruise um, tour director or guy on the bus that says, to your left, you're going to see the Jaws exhibit, you know, or whatever that is, right? Because, yes, you're doing something that, is important to communicating to people and to keep it light and move it along. But the studio has no idea what you're doing. And the people on the tram are like, they don't even know why you're there. And you know, you kind of, you're like the losing um, fighter in a wrestling match. You just have to stay up. You just have to stay in the game <laughs> till the end of the fight. And then they'll pay you. Right. You yeah. know, they're not going to interview you afterwards. You're not going to get a prize or an endorsement and nobody's going to remember you a week later, but it is, it was good. It was good money. I will say that the, the way I was able to produce my first plays were by being a studio artist, warm up comedian and just thinking to myself, if I do five more episodes of this, I'll have enough money for my, the budget to produce my play. So it, it was a means to the ends of my artistic career, but but the day, it's hard to get into warm-up because it's a very hard job to get and it's hard to get out of it <laughs> because you kind of start to rely on the money and you go, oh, if I go back to being a club comic, I'm only going to make a few dollars a night, you know? So, you know, you really got to pull the ripcord. And I would say that to anybody in any creative career that, 
you know, holding on to an insurance policy does not necessarily springboard you into the adventure you want, the real thing you want. You've got to cut the cord to those kind of things you're hanging on to. And you you did it over the pandemic with the mural painting and all of that. I was my mind was blown about how invested you got in to that. How many how many murals did you paint uh, all told in the last couple of years? I think I painted on ten murals, um, and I think a total of twenty three went up um, between September of twenty twenty and now. Okay, and did you design some? I designed six of them. Um, and then there are actually, there's one being painted right now. Um, the university in ta- in Carbondale town closest to us, um, their school of art and design saw what we were doing and wanted to be a part of it. And so they created a, a course for public art and part of that course is they're putting one up and it's all a master's course. So it's all masters art students that are all painting on a wall here in Marion right now and putting up a piece. That's great. Yeah. We've got some upcoming muralists on our podcast that I'm recording in in a little bit. And I'm kind of fascinated by that one painting outdoors with the elements and all of that kind of thing. And also the fact that it's kind of a, it's a happening. It's a theatrical happening while it's unfolding. And then of course it has a life for a long time after that, but it is it's definitely an, an installation also involves a performance. Yeah. The, the first one we did, we, uh, we started kind of trying loosely, loosely keeping track. And I think we had over 700 people come by to, to watch us paint in those, in those first like 10 days. Um, and then as we did the rest of the murals, people would be, uh, you know, tagging us on Facebook and, saying, you know, hey, we're driving by every day to see the progress. It's what our kids do. That's what we do with our kids after school. Uh, we go by and check on the artwork and see how it's developing. And um, and so it, it creates a great interaction with the community. It creates a great... Uh, there's, there's a satisfaction in knowing that it's automatically touching people. But at the same time, as an artist, people are seeing the entire process... And there's a good portion of time when a piece of work is just ugly. Yeah. And they're seeing all of that. And and uh, there was one piece we did that was on like a five-story building. And we initially did a base paint in in its overall form in this like basically a, a copper patina green. And they're like, what in the world is happening? <laughs> and that's just the undercoat that everything's going on top right, of. It's a primer, right. Right, and um, and it's going to show through in some spaces because we were painting a representation of a statue, and so it's going to have some patina detail on it. But the the outpouring of comments on social media about the great green monster that we're painting downtown was just something else. Uh, that's really funny. I hired a great uh, scenic artist named Craig Lee in Omaha one time, and I needed this pack backdrop painted. It was 30 by 40 feet or something. And it was meant to hang through the on the whole back of this set for my play Bunk Bed Brothers. And he I knew he was the guy for the job, but I he didn't work at a place where he could paint it like he used to. And so I had to find a space. And the children's museum in that town had a big open floor space and he we we set up camp. But it was an active pe- place kids passed and all of that kind of stuff. And that all was all fine because they were kind of interested in seeing what he was doing, but he didn't finish in time. So he had an extra week, which didn't mean anything to me, but the museum was going to use that space to put on part of a dinner and a gala. And I was like, I can't, I can't, will you put a rope around him? Can he, can he just be a living exhibit? Because I need this thing done. And they and because it was raising money for a children's museum, it totally turned out fine. But this guy worked around the clock and I would have to send call and send food in because he wouldn't take time to go out and eat. Mm-hmm. I mean he got so engrossed in it. And there's a beautiful, beautiful backdrop. But you know, I mean I love stories like that where people's purpose and passion are all built around making something come to life and you know, we love that backdrop yet today. We use it in the show. So, 
And so you talk about bed, Bunk Bed Brothers. Didn't that become something with a television studio? Yeah, NBC bought the uh, license, the rights to it to make a sitcom, which was called American Pie, prior to the movie being American Pie. And we did shoot six episodes of the very elusive, um, I would call it musty TV. It's sitting in the vaults of NBC somewhere. Um, it was a, a really super fun Midwestern sitcom, but it didn't find its way to the airways because NBC felt it was a little too, um, not rural, but it just didn't have the urban you know, lineup feel that, that Friends had and other shows that were taking place in New York. So, um, mm-hmm. But we learned a lot. We were able to make six episodes uh, like we were at film school, cast it, write it, shoot it. And, and so none of that ever graced the airwaves at all? Well, a one episode was put on haphazardly uh, in a panic by some executive because a World Series game ran short on the East Coast. And he knew he would. there was going to be an empty time on the Mountain and West Coast time. And it was like, I want to say it was Labor Day because there was nobody around to ask, what am I going to do? You know, <laughs> and because I, I was as surprised as anybody to get calls from Denver and San Francisco. Hey, your show's on. And I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> um, but the thing I came to discover afterwards, and there's no sour grapes about it, but is that when they played it in two time zones, they couldn't get the metrics to say the data that tells us how it went and how many people watched because it was kind of damaged. Uh-huh. So when they went to try to sell it to another network or something, they go, well, you've already aired some of this. Like, are you selling us your dirty garbage? You know what I mean? Um, but, you know, again, I made great friendships out of it. I learned a lot. I, I was a producer on that show and it taught me how to make a television show which helped me in other jobs that I do. And certainly as a theater producer, you know, that's as, as stressful as a thing you can is to be dealing with the network's money and advertisers and, you know, the critics that look at that stuff. I'm a big fan of original content and creating original content. So that is, uh, that is not something that Hollywood or the movies, they like derivative. They like just to say, what is this like? You know, can you tell me what two action movies this is a meld between or whatever? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's one of the things with theater and particularly with comedy. The Good Humor Men is a great place for me to bring the best of stand-up comics together in charge of their own material. It's ever-evolving because whatever they're writing new, if they've had kids or a divorce or something and they have new content, then we're up to date, you know, coming into this show in Marion you know, we have the perspective of everybody globally has experienced certain things, whether that's masks or politics or other things. And we kind of stay away from the hot, hot topics. Like we don't, we want to bring people together and not divide them. But, um, but it is funny when we have a, a public consciousness of something like Wordle or something, Mm -hmm. it's sort of just, okay, let's talk about it. Just adds to that shared experience. Yep. Um, And and you're talking about creating original content you you mentioned your podcast creativity and captivity which the logo is right there behind you how did that come about i'm i'm a huge fan um i've been a listener from the start just you you mentioned it to me and i i jumped right on board and i've loved all of it i can't wait for thursday mornings and sometimes late late wednesday nights when i listen um because i i love the content that you're creating and the, the guests that you have can you tell us how that came to be Yeah, the nature of it was after, I guess about eight or nine months into the pandemic, I started to feel frustrated because, number one, there was no outlet for theater, right? No performance. Also producing, and I was directing television commercials, and I couldn't get production together. So every opportunity was falling away. And I used to think I had a pretty good toolkit for staying busy, but it all related to people gathering and coming together. So I thought, oh, well, we don't have venues, but I still have a voice. And maybe I can be a more hopeful voice as we're moving forward if I don't spend my time frustratedly panicking or hoarding or doing the things that I was seeing happen. So I thought, you know, I creative consult on projects all the time. So I I have access to some of these people, whether it's a filmmaker or 
uh, advertising agency or any kind of thing because they want to punch up their stuff with humor or they want to have some copy written or they so I thought I do this I have these phone calls already what if I open up these phone calls to let people listen in but I knew I couldn't do it on their specific projects because I have non-disclosure agreements a star movie or a something whatever Cirque du Soleil or whatever and so the notion of those things was Maybe I can ask some of these people if they'll have a phone call in general about, about, about the creative process and not specifically about what what's on their plate at the moment. And so I got very, very lucky in the first handful of people that that uh, the chief creative officer, Pixar, Pete Doctor, w- who was a friend. It was great. And one of my favorite episodes to date was the one with Pete Doctor. And having a six-year-old daughter, every time one of the films that he worked on that you guys discussed in that podcast comes up, all of the things that he discussed come flooding back to me. And, and, and so it, that specific ev- episode is almost like ever present for me. Oh, interesting. Well, for me, it, it was really my first hosting thing with the show. It was a very casual, it was the, it was the tone that I was going for. So I thought, well, this is unbelievably easy, which it was, <laughs> it isn't. But Pete, of course, made it that way. We talked about storytelling. We talked about flip books. We talked about animation. We talked about just, you know, how creativity in general is something that can be contagious, but it, you can't do it at the same time as you're judging what you're doing. And all of those things felt transferable. And, and I always imagine this podcast with the listener in mind. I want you to be at the coffee table with us and be inside something that you couldn't hear unless you were backstage on a Broadway show or you were in a planning session with a choreographer or you were in the museum with the dinosaur guy, whatever it is. I feel like I wouldn't, most of these things I don't know anything about. So I'm the luckiest person in the whole thing is I'm in a seat of curiosity and I'm, I'm just trying to sort of unearth interesting stories and little valuable golden tidbits. And it became for me a very interesting pattern of making me feel much better about the world and the people, which was I would set a play date essentially with whoever I wanted to talk to Mm -hmm. a musician, a uh, aerialist, whatever, a ventriloquist. And I would go, Oh, okay. I have that coming up on Friday. So on Wednesday, I'll watch their movie. I'll read their book. I'll do something. I'll write their introduction. So already now my week went from nothing happening to, oh, I get to talk to the guy from They Might Be Giants. I love that band. Oh, I'll start listening to their music on Spotify. Okay, then I'll do this. I'll do that, right? So it it turned my weeks around. And in general, the exchange was always hopeful. So I'm learning and networking and doing all that kind of stuff. Podcasting is is a new medium for me, but it is very interesting that it's a niche audience. So when you say that you look forward to Thursday or you jump on board late Wednesday when it comes up, um, because we drop it on the West Coast, so it's there in the morning on Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. But the West Coasters can get it at 9 p.m. Pacific time. And for you, I imagine that's almost midnight, right? It's like 11. 11, yeah. 11 or midnight. And and I'm up about half of those times and and I'll listen to it right when it drops. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it's such a, there's always something interesting. And I can't tell you going into what it is because I typically don't write questions. I will generally write one jumping off way to get in. And then it's conversational flow. And I always encourage them if they've got, it's kind of them, they can get a free um, consulting thing out of it if they ask me something. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's just, it really, it's super fun. And I really, I feel like we've created a community. The people who write us regularly or who recommend a guest, mm-hmm. we've been getting some really interesting referrals. We have a uh, artesian chocolatier that makes candy. We have a marching arts maverick, which is a guy that designs halftime shows for you know, high school bands and colleges and drum and bugle corps. We just talked to that guy and it's, I mean, it's really eclectic. So it's visual arts. Um, We've got designers of all kinds. We've got writers of all kinds, but playwrights, screenwriters. Some of the, some of the Disney Imagineers have been some of my favorite episodes as well. Just hearing about the, the immersive design of the parks and, and how they approach that. Uh, You're one of your most recent episodes 
um, featured um, Rody. Joe uh, Joe Rody. Joe yeah. Rody. And and hearing him talk about the research experience that goes in was was amazing. Um, but there's so much creativity that is applied in reality that that people you know people see it as a park but they don't see it as this is artwork that people have created as an immersive experience for you to walk through that that creates your experience which is why disney parks are so beloved right and also the woman doris hardoon that was an imagineer she created and designed the castles for shanghai disney and hong kong disney and culturally the hub of being around the spoked wheel with all the greenery and the plants, they have a whole different cultural experience where there used to be, you know, less kids. And so they think of the kids, the parents and the grandparents as communing and photographing themselves in those parks. So it all, they do take a lot into consideration in how we traffic and what we like to eat and what it takes to stand in line. How do we make this, line interesting you know so it is it's really awesome and and we just are i think we're getting luckier and luckier in that the guests seem to want to be on the show and we'll get contacted by publicists or we'll be reached out by some you know somebody who says how do we get on this which is a far cry from the beginning when we're like how do we convince people we're really doing something here you know um so it's it's fun i mean it's a it's a it's a very rich uh thing that i now that I'm working in, I don't want to stop doing it. It's, it adds an awful lot to the fabric of my life. It also, we've been able to connect the guests, a musician with an artist, a rock poster designer with somebody. And so we're kind of right in the middle of being sure that everybody gets a uh, opportunity to collaborate with each other. And that's super exciting. Like that, I like that place. Because I'm outside of the loop. I live in Austin, Texas, and happily. But I'm not really in the day-to-day -day that I used to be when I was in California and when I used to be in New York theater and other things, I don't really interface with people the same way. So the podcast has really opened a, a door and window uh, to everybody knowing what we're up to. And I, I've said this to you before, but seriously, thank you for what you're doing with it because it's, it's a great, for me, being able to hear the the creative professionals that are on such a high elite level talking about their craft, I I love it, and I, I recommend creativity and captivity to anyone. It's it's available on all podcast streaming, audio yeah. apps. Um, but uh, so we've talked before already about you've got good humor men coming in here, um, and. Uh, part of part of the marketing language for that talks about, you know, comedians and personalities from late night TV. What has been your experience with late tight, late night TV? You've performed on almost all of the late night programs over the time over the past, however many years, thirty years. Right. My first, I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I go back to doing Merv Griffin and and like like names people don't even know these days, right? But it was really the beginning of understanding what doing a monologue on television, whether they give you five, six, seven minutes, you know, like it, it's less now than it used to be. But understanding an opening line, understanding a closing line, knowing what a callback is, being sure that you're doing a strong enough set to be invited back. Like it all, it's all a very, very specific thing that you're doing because they don't get, you don't get to do your whole hour and you don't get to do your best of you. And, and when you spend it, when you come back the next time, you don't get to use that opening line. You don't get to use that closing line. Right. So you're always trying to build a really good appearance. And I think the, the biggest one for me was the tonight show with Johnny Carson, because I grew up in Nebraska and he was a Nebraskan and he was the ultimate endorsement. If you could get the, the, the thumb and finger circle, like the okay symbol from him, it launched your career. Yeah. And I was a little late. There were guys and, and I would put them in the Seinfeld Leno era that everybody in the country would see a tonight show appearance. By the time I was there in the freshman class of that group or whatever, there were so many more channels and so much more going on that you were lucky if somebody, you know, DVR'd you or something, you know. Um, but it was still great to promote a club date or to to get the endorsement to see as seen on the Tonight Show meant a lot. So subsequently, I did it another six or seven times with Jay Leno, 
And, you know, that would be every, you know, 18 months or something, you know, for, I, I had a lot of seasonal material, you know, from my visits to your venue with the Wonder Bread years and some other performances that I have Halloween material, I have Thanksgiving material, I have Christmas material. So I specifically was writing that way because of late night television, because I thought, oh, if I have material about eggnog and nativity scenes and whatever, they'll put me on in December, mm -hmm. right? Like I didn't tell them that, but I would, I had a big chunk of Halloween jokes and I was like, I'll be ready by the time October, oh, they're going to see this set and go, oh, we got to have this guy in October. So it was a way to, to earn my spot in the year somehow, mm -hmm. right? And I did this, used to do this thing where I balanced a burning napkin on my nose and to the John Williams Olympic music and it would come down. And when there was a simulcast, something from the Olympics, from the improv and Greg Luganis came in, they picked me because I had an Olympic piece of material, right? <laughs> so I didn't, you know, it was sort of, I learned as I went on that. But um, over the years though, there were all kinds of, there was a boom of evening at the improv, comedy tonight, comic strip live, all of those kinds of things. And many people of my generation got an experience at doing television. Some of those people now are in the, you know, they're the hosts of these shows, you know, like, like we're into a new time in late night and there's some amazing people, right? Yeah. There was a, there, there was Letterman and Carson and Leno and stuff. And then there was a little bit of what's going to happen. And now there's this whole, I mean, I love Stephen Colbert and I, I like, they're different. You know, Jimmy Fallon is different. You know, Jimmy Kimmel is different. They're different kinds in a way of personalities. And one is hosting games and one is like politically astute and one is, a, you know, the bad boy or whatever, right? But Seth Meyers will have, have authors on and other things like that. So they've kind of all found, I think, their, you know, their audience and, and their guest list uh, out of that. And they don't seem to be competing or struggling about if you're on that show, you can't be on this yeah, show. Yeah, it's right? not like the late night wars with Leno and Letterman. Um, yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you. Did you did you ever, I, because you were connected with The Tonight Show, did you ever do Letterman? I did. I was suited up and I was in makeup and I was uh, and I was staying at a hotel they, that I was being put up. But, but it I was bumped you know, that moment was not, didn't come to life. And then it never got to come back around, but you know, it is what it is at that point. But, um, but I've had some other crazy, you know, invites to do things. And, and there is an upcoming Johnny Carson exhibit going to the national comedy center in upstate New York, Jamestown, New York. And I'm super excited about going to see this exhibit. It's got Johnny's Rainbow Curtain and lots of other memorabilia. And they, it's such an amazing destination to go to. It's only a few years old. And I had the executive director of that museum on the podcast because I thought that was an interesting kind of job, you know, mm -hmm. to be a comedy museum curator. Um, and I believe this summer I'm going to go there and I'm going to produce a show, a live show, with some of Johnny's favorite guests that had been on magicians and ventriloquists and people like that. And so, you know, the, just the connection to that era and to late night has offered me other opportunity would not have had if I didn't, you know, if I didn't pursue that. And I, I, I think it just sort of gave me a lot of confidence to have Johnny give me the thumbs up, right? you like, you just want somebody to tell you you're doing the right thing. You know? Yeah. And, and being Johnny Carson, he's the right person to tell anybody that they're doing the right thing. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, but I will say, I feel like I'm still an unknown name and it, you know, like coming to your town, I don't think the name Pat Hazel is a draw, but people in the arts or people who I work with know that my vanity isn't what I sell. It's an uplifting experience. So whether it's the wonder bread years or the more men or permanent record or any of these shows that I've, you know, the, the database, uh, my return is pretty good. Meaning people who come to the shows go, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? It's sort of... Yeah, yeah. And, and and you've been here before with Wonder Bread Years. If if anybody watching remembers Wonder Bread Years here at the Civic Center, it was a tremendous night. The audience was rolling in laughter the entire time. Um, and, and you do something amazing with that show in connecting to people's uh, nostalgia 
and and childhood memories while bringing them laughter. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you, I discovered that a little bit through my own family's slides that my parents had, and I start doing slideshows within that show and in other places, and it is it adds a warmth, but it also means that when I talk about Christmas, you're thinking about your holidays, not mine. It's a little bit of a, a magic trick. It's a little way of having the person um, remember their worst Halloween costume or, you know, them having to recycle their Christmas gift wrap under the tree. And it's a little less um, of it being at my an ego-driven thing and more of a invite people to come on the ride. Well, and it reminds me of something that I, I heard a Disney Parks marketing executive say in a in a conference at one point that Disney doesn't sell fun at the park. They sell lifelong memories with your family. They sell your childhood memories that you remember and you wanting them to instill them in your children. That is their marketing model. Yeah. And there's a, there's a big lesson, by the way, in any profession that you are doing something different than you think you're doing, right? So in the business <laughs> you and I are in, people go, oh, they're putting on entertainment. But while that we are doing that, the fact is we're in the real estate businesses. And the aha of that for me was we're renting seats. And mm -hmm. if the seats are empty, it's a bad day in real estate because the minute the curtain goes up, all that real estate goes bad. And yeah. so, of course, people choose a show like a Tony winner or a something because it will fill more seats, more nights, and it will make more money, which means we can afford to do more shows, right? So you have to be able to do both. You have to have a business mind and you have to have an arts mind and you have to be sure that you're satisfying that entertainment need, that music need, whatever that experience is. But empty seats means you're not going to be around that long and you're not going to be collaborating with folks. And, uh, you know, I find that it's a really, uh, it's a real dance because it's not guaranteed because you put on a show that people will come. Every show has its own marketing strategy, has its own audience. Can we get a country audience to come to this town? Yes. But can we get a rap audience to come the next night? Don't know, right? Or whatever. So and it's challenging. Similar to the real estate business, it's also about creating that relationship and and creating, uh, you know, it, it's that interactional relationship where people will continue to come to your shows because they feel a connection to you from seeing your show. That is true. And, and similar for the venue, they'll continue to come just like in the real estate business. If someone feels connected to a specific real estate agent and will continue to go back to that real estate agent because of that relationship and connection. Right. And the word there is trust, right? Mm -hmm. So they trust your curation. If you're choosing shows and they've had good experiences in your venue and they don't know whether this is good or bad, they're going to relate to their last couple of experiences there. And if they have a bad experience in your venue, they're going to go, let's go somewhere else or let's do something else. So, of mm -hmm. course, you want to pick acts that don't create a bad experience for them, right? And and some, you know, some artists do some wildly different things than other artists, but it's about the overall experience in the venue. And does the venue maintain a consistency to that? And it's the same. Look, I like to gamble and try new things and see if they're good or bad. But I typically don't put it into a performing arts center at full price at that moment. I might start at a smaller place and I might be in a different marketplace and I might run it for a little bit longer, changing it, tweaking it, getting it better. I think by the time we get to a good humorman show, it's it's our best of I pick guys that don't have to do heavy lifting. They've they've done this stuff before. They're writing all the time. You know, they're at the top of their game. And while we have a stable of comics that are six or seven folks, we're picking the hottest one that's in the route that can get to the place. And the experience is really fun. We have points of view of somebody that's single, somebody that's married, somebody that, you know, has been through something. Or, you know, um, it's just a very, very, I don't know, it's a kind of a nice night of different kinds of laughter, right? Somebody who might be, you know, sillier than somebody else or more cerebral. And it's kind of like a one night comedy festival. Yeah. And, and I, the, the, the comics that you've curated for this one, Tony Deo and Keith Alberstadt, their resumes are fantastic. And I am incredibly confident at how wonderful of a night it's going to be particularly because we have so much faith in you because you've already put on wonderful shows here. 
And and so I know that as the the host and the curator of the night, you're bringing something really special to Marion on July 22nd. Yes, July 22nd. And uh, I I mean I I'm a big fan of an audience experiencing comedy as a group. Um, there, there's been a new trend. There's some fantastic Netflix specials, of course, and all those kinds of things, which are really fun if you're just laying in bed and want to watch something funny. But there is nothing like being surrounded by other people laughing. And I really missed that the last few years. And I, well, and yeah. You know, and there's something about those Netflix specials. I mean, they're still, they're still filmed in front of a live audience for the most part. And in turn, you're still laughing with people, even though they laughed however long ago. You're still laughing with others. And it, it gives you almost a feel of a communal experience without actually being Right. There. And if you saw any, a couple of people shot pandemic specials where they social distance or they had no audience at all. And the difference is monumental, you know, to the, the timing. The energy in the specials is just, it's not there. Yeah. And that, that I will speak to a comic's. Uh, confidence and insecurities, right? Which is you're surfing a wave of laughter. If you don't hear the laughter, you either think it's not funny or the rhythm of the story isn't quite right. And it's kind of like if you've been telling stories with uh, with cuss words and then you take the cuss words out to go on TV, the rhythm of it isn't quite the same and the laughs aren't in the same places. So, you know, that I, I don't think there will ever be a kind of successful stand-up comedy which is audience no audience that's that's almost most of the magic is in the air in between the performer and the audience right if they're laughing they'll that comic will milk it they'll go extra they'll roll their eyes they'll do whatever they need to do to keep that laugh going right and and mm -hmm. similarly when they stink when it's crickets and it's silent there's nothing more deadly than that. And the comic will make an adjustment. They'll 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 make a comment on it. They'll say, you know, I'm really stunk it up, you know, and they'll win that audience back. So that's that's a really I guess that's the most to me live or immediate sense of how the arts works. Um, and where you really I really notice it is radio, when comics should go on morning radio and they would have like two DJs and they would try to do jokes from their act they would do for an audience and the DJs just sit there. It's just the worst moment in morning radio to hear a guy dying and other people not, mm. you know, it's just the worst. Well, Pat, I want to be respectful of your time. I, I, I appreciate the time you've spent with us today and I'm so excited for your show coming up. Um, we, we also hope to have Tony and Keith on the podcast as well in upcoming weeks you know, leading up to the show in July. Um, if you've enjoyed the talk today, tickets are available at marioncc.com. And uh, Pat, thank you again. Well, you're welcome. I can't wait to get there. That's, you have good audiences. So if they come, we'll be there. Thank you for joining us for State of the Art Southern Illinois, a podcast by the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Featuring artists, artisans, musicians, arts events, and arts organizations in Southern Illinois, as well as touring artists coming to the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. You can find a new episode every Thursday on whatever podcast platform you choose, or YouTube, or Facebook. Tune in and listen.